talking today to Jonathan Miles, who is the author of The Nine Lives of Otto Katz. Jonathan, describe briefly what Otto Katz was and why he is interesting. What Otto Katz was, he was a communist spy, he was... Um, why he's interesting, he's a figure that takes us through the history of the first half of the 20th century in a fairly exciting way. Wherever the action was, uh, Otto Katz was there, uh, working for the Russians, working for the Russians in uh, Germany in the 1920s, in England and France in the 30s, went over to Hollywood and organized the uh, anti-Nazi league, and then um, was part of the Russian presence in the Spanish Civil War. During the Second World War, uh, he was laying the foundations in South America for the eventual communist putsch uh, after the war. And then he went back to Czechoslovakia hoping to reap the rewards of uh, three or four decades of service to the Communist Party and fell victim to the uh, last purge trial, the Slansky trial, um, in which Stalin sought to eradicate people who uh, he no longer needed, or uh, just people because they were Jewish, or they'd fought in the Spanish Civil War, and he was uh, hung. And what motivated him to become a communist? Uh, what motivated He came from a very privileged Czech background, but uh, it was a privileged background with a certain constraint to it. He was always an outsider. He was a Czech uh, in uh, Russian-speaking Jewish Czech. A minority in a culture that was um, torn really between East and West. Um, he was very spoiled as a child. Uh, his older brother went off um, to uh, Leipzig and uh, to a communist uh, party conference there and brought back a lot of literature when Otto was about uh, I suppose 13, 14, 15 and he started reading these pamphlets and became um, absorbed by socialism and eventually communism. But he was also um, something of a bohemian and uh, a great flirt with women. Yes, he was, uh, he was quite something on the Czech scene, I think, the Czech mm. literary scene and artistic scene. Uh, his enemies said that um, he was popular because he had the money to pay uh, for other people's productions or indeed to publish privately his, uh, his own poetry or his uh, drama. But he was... Um, certainly involved uh, heavily with Czech theatre. His father wanted him to go into business, sent him off to business school. Even at business school he managed to get, uh, you know, this is the equivalent of, uh, uh, of, I don't know, an MBA today, and he was uh, able to organise a strike among what were presumably fairly right-wing students. Uh, so he was politically activated early on. Um, and I think uh, probably the First World War also, uh, what he mm. saw, he, he, he was a deserter, deserted several times, uh, as a lot of the Czech army did. Um, and I think probably what he saw and what he understood about the reasons for the First World War pushed him in the direction of communism. And he was to become involved with the Communist International, the Comintern. How did that come to be formed and what role did it play? Well, it came to be formed shortly um, after the First World War and the idea was that it would export communism mm -hmm. worldwide. That mm -hmm. was the intention. In fact, shortly after the Russian Revolution, all the typists were sitting, sitting in their rooms in St. Petersburg waiting for calls to come in mm -hmm. from all over the globe saying, revolution in Spain, revolution mm -hmm. in America. Of course, it didn't happen. Um, and uh, Lenin realized that they needed a slightly more measured approach and uh, set up the Comintern and the idea was that it would uh, through propaganda and also through uh, I suppose you could say good works and aid mm. to the workers in each country uh, steadily attract and to the communist parties in those countries and to the communist parties yes. indeed it became a kind of um, feed organization mm. for, for funds for people and indeed for spies one of the people that Otto Katz is closely involved with is somebody called Willy Munzenberg, who was one of Lenin's friends from pre-revolutionary Zurich. How did Otto Katz come to meet him? Well, they were both in Germany together. Otto was somewhat of a playboy in those days. He was, um, again, part of the artistic set in Berlin. He was uh, working uh, part-time for various socialist periodicals and also part-time in uh, backstage in the theatres. And uh, Willy Munzenberg had a very attractive, uh, rather chic wife called Babette. And uh, at the time, Munzenberg's 
enterprise was expanding. He was in the process of setting up um, publishing houses, um, producing periodicals, as well as raising funds for um, hmm. Russia, which was suffering from a, a series of rather severe famines at the time. Um, he sent Babette Gross off to see this um, representative at one of the socialist um, magazines. She walked in and she saw this dilettante, overdressed, pampered looking person and she thought there's no way, there's no mm. way that she's going to get him to uh, <laughs> to review a serious communist um, book and uh, it was Otto Katz. Mm. Otto Katz surprised her by agreeing to publish it, shortly afterwards uh, telephoned her on the make as usual with the ladies and invited her out for a coffee. Uh, she accepted, hoping for another review of yet another communist pub publication. And um, Otto, who was a very theatrical person, took great delight uh, in suddenly producing his Communist Party card in front of her in the cafe. Mm. And that's how uh, he met Munzenberg through the bed. Um, Munzenberg is a very unusual figure because he, he okay. is... He's, he's somebody with enormous propaganda skills, and he's also a red millionaire. He's a sort of communist champagne millionaire from funds provided by the Soviets. Describe what he did. Well, the funds provided by the Soviets really just were the ground base of this enormous hydra-headed operation, which um, really took place... I mean, it, he had publications in Japan, he set up aid organizations in America, very extensive network in, in first in Germany and then after the Nazis came to power uh, they transferred to Paris. Um, and he distributed and made films? He, he distributed and made films, indeed he did. Uh, promoting Battleship Potemkin? He promoted Battleship Potemkin and then fought the authorities in Berlin when they uh, tried to ban it. Um, yes, he was, he was a phenomenal person, he did a great fantastic capitalist gift for making money. He was, a, mm. he was an entrepreneur. He couldn't help uh, but make money. So he was an anomaly uh, within communism. He was, but he was also maybe. very skilled politically at getting together kind of coalitions of unlikely people. Probably his major talent, I would say, is bringing together, uh, uh, for instance, against the recommendations of the communist hierarchy in Moscow, he took on Katz. He recognized mm. that Katz would play a useful role in the propaganda war. He had all the talents for schmoozing, for um, for playing many roles, really. Mm. Uh, but how, how was he able, in a sense, to ignore what the Soviet hierarchy through the Comintern was saying to him? I think simply because he had the money to do it. He, 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 he bankrolled his own machine. Yes, and he was on the ground, as it were. He was on the ground and he was in control enormously. He was called back to Moscow and reprimanded uh, several times in the, in the, in the uh, 30s. And the last time he went, he very swiftly recognized that uh, he and his wife were in a very dangerous situation. They weren't put up in the normal hotel. They were treated, um, in fact, they, they were worried that they would be able to get out mm. um, of, of Moscow. They managed to. And then he effectively went into hiding. Mm. He was persona non grata as far as the communists were concerned. And Katz, at that point, uh, turned against him. And what was Katz's relationship with Marlene Dietrich? <laughs> well, the stories are legion. Uh, they were certainly good friends. They had a long-term relationship. Um, the journalist Claude Coburn uh, states that um, Otto Katz was insistent that they uh, were married uh, when she was very, very young, uh, that they'd briefly been married. There's only a very short time span when that could have happened because Katz married a, a, a Czech actress called Sonia Bogsova in 1921 and Dietrich married uh, Rudy Seiber in 23. So it if they were indeed married, it would have happened probably just after the First World War when Katz was um, working in rep in mm. northern Czechoslovakia. She may have been on a, a uh, you know, in a part of a tour. Um, they certainly knew each other in Berlin mm. uh, backstage and they were great friends. And I think they had a probably quite a tender relationship. 
And Katz was sent to Moscow, where he worked ostensibly for a state publishing house. What, what was he actually most likely to have been doing there? Well, he, he was working for a state publishing house. He was also in charge of um, Mesropom Rus, which was one of the Munzenberg uh, enterprises. Um, it was a film studio, so he was in charge of production, and Katz took a lot of the uh, German talent he'd worked with in, in, in uh, Berlin with him. Uh, he was also uh, training to be a, to, to be a spy. He yeah. was in Moscow, he was sort of, and, and indeed during his time in Moscow, he was um, sent on various missions to the to the West. And shortly thereafter, there was the burning of Germany's parliament, the Reichstag, which provided the moment for the Nazis to, in a sense, crack down to create the repression that that closed down the certainly the communists and many other members of the opposition. How did this affect Katz and Luntzenberg? Well, I really started things going for them in a big way. It, mm. it, it, it galvanized their, um, their, 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 whole, uh, their whole mission, really stemmed from the burning of the Reichstag. They, they saw a tremendous opportunity. Um, the, the, the Nazis were trying to pin it on the communists, uh, and Munzenberg understood immediately that uh, they should uh, pin it on the Nazis and they started a huge investigation which mm. led to the uh, Brown Book of Hitler Terror being written by a panel of people in Paris, people like Gustav Regler, uh, Otto Katz, um, and this book sold phenomenally worldwide, phenomenally. The, the cover was designed by John Hartfield. Indeed, the, a striking image of, uh, uh, of uh, Hermann Goring laid out on, on, on a sort of the flat part of a inverted swastika mm. or turned swastika um, and uh, an amazing cover mm. and an amazing book because it was the first time that the world uh, really had any idea of what the Nazis were doing in their underground jails, their torture rooms, uh, their attitude towards Jews. It's particularly interesting in terms of I think Britain where so many people um, in the establishment were in denial. Mm. They said they knew nothing about Nazi atrocities as mm. late as 38 or 39, complete nonsense. Mm. I mean, this book had wide coverage and it was seen, I think, as more than an act of propaganda. It was taken seriously. And they, in effect, won the propaganda war with Goebbels and Hitler, didn't they? Because actually, by the time it came to trial, it was very clear that you know, the, the, the sentence had been in a sense, given already. Well, they did a second bit. Katz had a brilliant idea, which was actually to anticipate the trial by doing a, a sort of mock trial mm. in London, uh, pulling together judicial uh, luminaries from America, from Norway, from all over Europe. Um, and in the courtroom at the Law Society, they had a mock trial mm. in which they put um, the Nazis, uh, as it were, in absentia in, 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 the, in the witness box. And their verdict came out before the trial in Leipzig started, mm. the real trial, uh, where the Nazis were trying to pin it on a, uh, uh, on a, on a Dutch homosexual called Marius uh, van der Lubach. 